I'd like to briefly talk about some parts of my process for making an exam like a midterm or a final for my first year calculus courses. Making an exam actually has a lot of moving parts. It's a complicated task, but I wanted to include a few things specifically about writing questions that I thought might be helpful or uh, demystifying. I often get asked about the difficulty of the questions that are going to be on the exam, and you should expect a range. I want the grades on my exam to, as accurately as possible, reflect the understanding that you're able to demonstrate of the relevant topics. So one thing I do is I think about what letter grade corresponds to what type of understanding. So passing is a 50 overall, maybe that means something slightly different on the exam when you factor it into the context of the whole course. But if I think about the minimum that a student needs to pass, these are prerequisite courses, they need to have some level in order to succeed in their later courses, I don't want to set them up for problems later on, I think about what that means. And then I think about how many points I want those students to get, and I try and make sure that there are questions totaling that number of points written at that level on an exam. On the other end of the spectrum, if I want to think about an A, the difference between an A and a B is being able to really apply things in out of the box ways to, to apply concepts in ways that you haven't seen before. And so there should be 20% or whatever that translates to on the exam uh, in the context of the course that are going to separate the A's from the B's and be actually quite complex. So when you walk into an exam, uh, you can expect a range of problems, and I usually put them in roughly this order too, uh, where a lot of them are quite straightforward, so very similar to things we've seen before, and then some of them are actually quite tough. What I often hear uh, as students walk out for an exam talking with each other is, oh, it started easy, but then I got so hard. Uh, yep, <laughs> correct. <laughs> That's on purpose. Uh, and something also to be aware of when you're in an exam is the way that these affect your emotions. Because what often happens is you start, you feel nervous, but pretty good. You get through these. And then at some point you hit a wall and you spend a bunch of time stressing out about the wall and you forgot that you have all of these points in the bag. So when you're in an exam and there's that one last question, you just don't know what's going on. Remember, that's a small portion of the exam and probably the straightforward questions early on, you aced and you're not even thinking about them anymore. And then of course, whatever's left is in the middle. In practice, usually this is smaller and, and this is a bit bigger, but for the sake of argument, this is roughly how we try and structure the problems on an exam. This is also hard in short exams because you don't have a lot of problems to distribute between these different, uh, different places. So maybe this will look like actually part A of a question and this will look like part B and part C. So the straightforward questions are straightforward. Uh, I will look through the syllabus for all the things I want you to know. Uh, usually these come last actually, because they're the easiest to write. So I look at the harder questions and I see, well, what, what, where are the gaps? And these are gonna look like uh, easy questions on a web work or when we first start a topic, the kind of examples that we might do in class. Usually people don't have a lot of problems with these, that's kind of the point. For the medium questions, there's a few ways that we can add a little bit of complexity without making it that really A plus level. One is to just take a problem from homework that was already quite hard. So when you saw it on your homework, maybe it was quite hard, but now you've seen it before. So now if you've paid attention on the homework, you know the big tricks and maybe we only have to change, change it a little bit. Another way is to take a number of straightforward functions and. Uh, a number of straightforward questions and kind of uh, weave them together. Now, the challenging questions, again, are a minority of points on the exam, but they do tend to be questions that cause a lot of stress. So uh, again, I don't want you to think that you have to spend all of your time on the hardest question. You are not intended to do that, but what can you expect from the hardest questions? To answer this, I thought about the first topic that we do in Math 102, and I thought about if I were to make a challenging question about this topic, how would I do it? So for the rest of this video, I'm going to be leading you through what I would do to generate a challenging question from a topic. So here's my topic, the relative shapes of power functions. Uh, if I have x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, close to zero, lower powers are much bigger relatively than smaller powers. Far from zero, it's the opposite. So this is what I want to test. 
Now, for it to be a challenging question, there should be some twist. This is your ability to take a concept and apply it in an unfamiliar way. So I need to do something different from what we've done in class. Now, in class, we usually say, okay, close to zero, what's it going to look like? Far from zero, what's it going to look like? And this comes up on the homework a lot. So one twist is to do that backwards. I'm going to tell you some characteristics, and I want you to decide, is it close or is it far? And this is a very common thing in math to, to take, you know, we've always done it in this direction. So if you want a challenge, we might ask you to do it in the other direction. So I'm starting to form the skeleton of a problem in my head. Okay, so given that one is dominating, are we talking about uh, close to zero or far away from zero? Okay, so this isn't a problem yet. I need to form it into a problem. Uh, one thing that I want to be uh, careful about is to not give you backdoors that don't test what I want to test. I want to test your application of this general principle. If I give you explicit functions, then there's a backdoor where you can just say, oh, well, if x squared is less than x cubed, I can just solve this and find that x is less than 1. And I don't want you to have that back door because that's not what I'm trying to test. It's probably being tested elsewhere on the test. So I'm not going to give these functions explicitly. So maybe I'll say something like, okay, instead of giving you, you know, x squared or x cubed, I'm going to say, okay, this is proportional to the surface area of a cube. So something like x squared, proportional to the volume of a cube, something like x cubed. So now I notice when I use this word proportional, uh, this is very particular vocabulary. And so now I'm testing an additional thing. If I leave this in, I'm testing whether or not you remember this vocabulary. And maybe I want to leave that in. Maybe I don't want to leave that in. So now I need to turn this into an actual problem that's readable by a human. So what I did was I just thought about what's a physical object where you might have something on the surface area and something in the volume in a cube. And uh, this is before lunch. So maybe... Uh, fancy fudge. So now I phrase this in terms of a question that's a little bit easier to understand and less vague. We're selling cubes of fudge wrapped in gold foil. So the fudge, how much fudge you're making, that's volume. If you're wrapping the outside, that's surface area. And I want the outside to actually matter. So let's make it out of something relatively precious. I need to differentiate between two kinds. And so instead of A and B, we'll say peanut butter and chocolate and so on. And now in writing this, instead of saying proportional, I said, well, foil is just depends on the area and the fudge, regardless of the uh, flavor, just depends on the volume. So I've actually taken out this extra thing that might have been being assessed in this question. Now I'm really not assessing on vocabulary so much. You don't have to remember proportional in order to understand this question. So the thing that you're asked is, okay, are we close to zero or far away? So I've changed that into which is sold in bigger cubes. So one of these is close to zero with a small side length. One of them is far from zero with a big side length. But there's actually only two options here, either peanut butter or fudge. So let's add something uh, so that we can't just guess the answer. So now this is the skeleton of a question that I really might put on an exam. It is testing a very particular concept. I've tried to make it relatively readable, and I've tried, because it's a challenge question, to give it a little bit of a twist. Now, this isn't done, and there's a lot that goes into writing questions and writing the exam. For this question, for instance, I would still want to probably tweak the language a little bit. There are things that we write uh, in uh, formal mathematics that don't make so much sense to people who aren't mathematicians. It's also good to check your language that you're not using too much specialized vocabulary that could confuse someone who's not a native speaker. We proofread it a million times. We think about, oh, is this something that I can mark easily over a thousand papers so that there's consistency? And then over the rest of the exam, there's just a million other things to think about. But as far as how question writing goes, uh, this is more or less my process. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of a better idea of how these exams come to be.